I read in the Bible where God bottles up your tears. Why then the tears, knowing God still loves you? But this is, song is called The Voice of Falling Tears. Lord, I don't even have the words to say. And I honestly would not know where to start. But even when my efforts are in vain, somehow my tears explain to you my heart. You hear my voice when I can't even say a word, when I can't speak. My silent cry your ears have heard, for I know you're somewhere watching, and you see each tear that's falling, and to you the message of each drop is clear. For Lord, you hear, I'm glad you hear, the voice of falling tears. Each teardrop speaks of loved ones gone astray. They tell of broken dreams of yesterday. Tears explain to you the heart of every man. This language only you can understand. You hear my voice when I can't even say a word, when I can't speak. My silent cry your ears have heard, for I know you're somewhere watching. And you see each tear that's falling, and to you the message of each drop is clear. For Lord, you hear, I'm glad you hear the voice of falling tears. When earthly words get in the way of this miracle I need, I just bow before your throne. Where once again my teardrops intercede. You hear my voice when I can't even say a word, when I can't speak. My silent cry your ears have heard, for I know you're somewhere watching. And you see each tear that's falling, and to you the message of each drop is clear. For Lord, you hear, I'm glad you hear the voice of falling tears. For Lord, you hear, I'm glad you hear the voice of falling all right, it's good to see you tonight. If you take your Bible and turn to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6 with me tonight. <clears throat> I've been fighting a little summertime cold the last three days. How many love to get a cold in the summertime? That... That just, it just doesn't even make any sense when you get a cold in the summertime, but I've been working on one, so if I'm coughing and sneezing, you'll understand why. But uh, had a good day today. Today was the hottest day, I think, all summer on the bus. It was just hard to run that bus ride. It was 95% uh, humidity and about 90%, uh, 90 degrees. That equals 180-something degrees on the bus. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, we had a good time. I had the opportunity to drive... Uh, the Maddox's bus home today, and they had to be off this afternoon, and I'll tell you what, we had a good time. Most of their bus routes are teenagers. I've never seen a bus route have just teenagers on their bus, but they, uh, they do a good job, and it's awesome, and we just had a good day today. You pray for our bus ministry as we get into the fall, fall uh, weeks now. We should be around 200 in the next couple of weeks, and then we'll see where God takes us from there, 
And uh, I tell you what, that's really amazing on five bus routes that God's blessed us like that. We've got some great workers in our bus ministry, in our Sunday school, in our children's church, in our teen churches. It takes everybody together and making it run like that. And uh, it's not just the bus ministry, it's everybody together. If we didn't have good classes, the kids wouldn't come. And if we didn't have good children's churches and middle school church and high school church, those kids wouldn't come. And uh, so uh, I, I praise the Lord for you and what you're doing, and, and you pray for us that, that God will bless there. Isaiah chapter 6, and uh, verse 1 through 9, and let's uh, read these verses, then we'll come back and look at them tonight. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. <clears throat> Above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, and the whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and whom sh who shall go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the good day, and Lord, I thank you for your word. I pray you'd bless your word tonight. Lord, I pray you'd help me to speak the words that you've given me through your Bible. And God, I pray for our people tonight. Lord, I pray you'd move upon us, Father. And Lord, just bless the message tonight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. I was going to originally call this sermon The Call of Isaiah, but then last night I was thinking about this. And I'm going to change the title of it, uh, Brother Stothus, to What Now, Isaiah? What Now, Isaiah? And so... Look at verse number 1. It says, In the year that King Uzziah died, about 750 B.C., King Uzziah, the king of Judah, had died. Isaiah was already a prophet of God. And so now the king dies. He's a, for the most part, Uzziah has been a good king. He, he took the throne when he was about 16 years old, and he reigned in Judah in the divided kingdom for about 50 years. And for the most part, he did a good job. For the most part, he was a good king. When you look at the list of all the kings of Judah, uh, most of them say uh, he, this king was a wicked, he did wicked in the sight of God, on and on and on and on and on. And then there's two or three that say that they did a good job. And so Uniah is one of those kings that was considered a king that did a pretty good job. He was not perfect by any means, but he did a pretty good job. He was well respected, and, 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 and God seemed to use him as king. But now the Bible says in verse 1, the king Uzziah has died. And I was thinking about this last night. I, I don't know, how many of you remember, you were alive, or maybe, maybe you weren't alive, but how many of you remember uh, when uh, President John F. Kennedy was assassinated? There may be a few folks that old. Uh, I can remember that. In 1963, uh, the President of the United States died. Now, I know you young people, you probably don't know what I'm talking about unless you learned it in history class. But uh, the thing about Kennedy being assassinated, a lot of people say, that say this, that you, do you remember where you were or, or who, do you, who, who you heard it from when Kennedy was assassinated? How many remember where you were? Or, or I remember exactly where I was. I was 10 years old in the fifth grade at Joel Chandler Harris Elementary School in the city of Atlanta. And when I got out of school that day, I walked across the, uh, the back uh, parking lot of the school and getting ready to cross uh, the street there. And somebody, while I was in the crosswalk, said, the president has been assassinated. I don't remember who said that, but I know exactly where I was. You see, it was a devastating event in the history of America. And, and even at a 10-year-old young boy, it just seemed to have an impact on my life. And if you remember, folks, if you were around many years ago, I know, you, I know Todd, you didn't think I was that old, but uh, if you were around back in those days, it seemed to just uh, put a grievance on America. It just seemed like at that particular time, after his death, America grieved, and it was a sad time uh, for, for many, many months after that. And even as a 10-year-old boy, I can remember how heavy my heart was that the president had died. 
And, uh, of course, after 1963, it seems like America started going to pot. I mean, literally going to pot, but, uh, you know, going to pot. And things uh, took a downturn for, uh, for America a after that. And, but I can remember as a boy the effect it had on even, I didn't understand it all, but it seemed to affect me. It seemed to affect my parents. It seemed to affect people around us that the president had died. And, and that's very similar to what Judah was going through because King Uzziah had died. Can you imagine 50 years reigning Judah and then he dies? A good king. And the Bible says that he died. And so this is the state of Judah. They're grieving. It's a, it's a hard time for them. And Isaiah is already a prophet. But I got to thinking about this uh, in these verses now. In verse number 1 it says, He died and it says, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up and His train filled the temple. And I thought about this. Listen, the king on earth is dead, but the king in heaven is alive. Amen? And you know what? When we go through the grieving thing in our lives, in our country, we have to remember that, 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 that there's a king in heaven that's still alive. Amen. I'm glad of that, aren't you? Hey, listen, uh, he died, but now Uzziah, the Bible says, that he had this, that God gave him this wonderful vision. And it says that the, he saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Now, the reason I got on this passage of Scripture is in my uh, college class, Class, I'm teaching Christology, and, and Christology is the study of the attributes and characteristics of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we were talking about this verse. We believe that this is a theophany. That means a pre-existing uh, appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ before he was born. And you'll see that. So I believe that this king that's sitting on the throne is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And, and uh, Isaiah, he got to see something that we don't get to see. We will one day, but not now. We're waiting to see it, but not now. John the Apostle got to see it. You read the book of Revelation, he almost it described exactly what Isaiah saw in this passage of Scripture. But I thought about it. What now, Isaiah? <clears throat> what are you going to do with your life? You see, Isaiah's already the prophet, and, and, and it seems like Judah's going down. Uh, it's not a perfect place. There's sin in the land, and there's sin in the camp, so to speak, and things are not going so well, and folks are grieving. And so Isaiah, he's the prophet of God. He's the one that's going to have to go and tell them their sin and preach to them. And, and God's looking for somebody to do that. And, and at the end, it says, who will go for me? Who will I send? And Isaiah steps up, and he says, I'll go. I'll do what you want me to do, Lord. And so here in this verse, in this verse 1, uh, he saw the Lord. Now, when I say what now, Isaiah, God is leading Isaiah to a fuller experience in his, in his ministry with him. You see, folks, uh, when you first get saved, uh, you don't know too much about the Bible. I didn't. Now, you, may, you may be a Bible scholar when you got saved, but I had no clue. I got saved when I was 22 years old. I was just a dumb, dumb 22-year-old kid. I didn't know anything about Scripture. I didn't know anything about the Bible. I didn't know anything about the Holy Spirit. I didn't know anything about justification. I didn't know anything, all that kind of stuff. I didn't know. And all I knew was uh, God changed my heart and He saved my soul, and I wanted to do something for Him. Amen. That's all I knew. So I started going around telling everybody about Jesus. I couldn't explain everything, but I was excited about what God wanted me to do. But then there came a time in my life where God began to call me to do something a little bit more. You see, I wasn't satisfied with sitting on the bench. I never could sit on the bench. Listen, if I'm going to play on your baseball team, I'm not going to play on your team if I've got to sit on the bench. I'm just not going to play. I'd rather go home and sit. And, you know, that's just the way I am. And so God was dealing with my heart about doing something. I didn't know what it was. And so listen, folks, listen. When you get saved and you want to do something for God, sometimes it's a process in your life. He takes you through steps in your life to get you where he wants you to be. Uh, listen, he might take you through some things in your life that you don't expect in this process. He might allow you to see some things in your life that you've never seen before in that process. He might give you some experiences in your Christian walk with Him uh, that you've never experienced before as He develops you into what He wants you to be for Him. So I know in my life uh, the things that I had to go through to get where I am today. Have I arrived? No. Can I go a little farther? Yes. And I want to. But you see, it's a process that God takes us through. And so God is taking Isaiah through this process because Isaiah is going to have to step up. There's somebody going to have to step up in the land and say, listen, the people are sinful. He's going to go there. Listen, those prophets of God, they preached the word of God. They weren't namby-pamby about it. They told them exactly what they were. And Isaiah is the man. And so what are you going to do now, Isaiah? <coughs> listen, uh, God is going to take him to another level. So in this process, 
uh, in Isaiah's life, I want you to know. I want you to notice just a couple of things. We'll be through. Number one, the revealing of God's holiness. The revealing of God's holiness. In verse number one, it says, "He saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple." Verse two, and it and it stood above. It stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his feet, and with twain he covered his uh, face, and twain he covered his feet. And with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. Man, what a vision. I would like to have seen that. I mean, listen, the, the, the revealing of God's holiness. Isaiah had to realize that he was serving a holy God. I personally believe this, that this is the Lord Jesus Christ there, and he sees this, and I want you to see some things. Uh, the seraphim saw him as holy. This is the only place in the Bible that talks about seraphim, these heavenly beings. Uh, this is the only mention. And notice about them, it says they had six wings, two wings to cover their face. The seraphim are unworthy to behold him with their eyes. And with two, they covered, the, they covered their feet. They're unworthy to serve him with their feet. And then there's two wings that, uh, that they're used to fly, and they're used to fulfill the will of God in the seraphim's life. And they worship holy, holy, holy three times a person. A, per, a picture of the Trinity, the Holy God, the Father, and the Holy Son, and the Holy Spirit. Holy, 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 they say. And they're worshiping this, the, this, this wonderful God. And uh, they see him high lifted up. I'd like to have seen that. And listen, uh, Isaiah sees the revealing of God's holiness. We don't talk about holiness much anymore, do we? My brother is a Nazarene pastor. They're considered a a holiness denomination. And, and they talk about the holiness of God. And they talk about the Holy Spirit of God working in our life. And I, 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 listen, we're, we're sometimes afraid to allow the Holy Spirit to work in our life. And we're afraid to meet the Holy God on His terms and say, Holy Spirit, take me and use me and make me what you want me to be. He's holy. They see Him high and lifted up. Notice the results about seeing holiness. Holiness will deliver us from low living. You see, we have to realize we're serving a holy God. Uh, we, he, it will deliver us from low living. Leviticus eleven forty four says, For I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves, and ye shall be holy, for I am holy. You mean I'm supposed to be holy? Yep, that's what the Bible says. Because He is holy, we're supposed to be holy. Well, that's a little bit too crazy for me, Brother Marty. I don't know if I can be holy or not. Uh, listen, it says in Leviticus that we are to sanctify ourselves. That word sanctified means to separate yourself. Listen, separate yourself, not just from stuff, but to God. And say, God, I'm going to give my life to you. There's things in my life I may have to separate from, but I'm going to give my life to you, God. And you're a holy God, and I'm going to worship you, and I want you to ser I'm gonna serve you with all that I have. And I'm going to give my life to you, and I'm going to sanctify myself. I'm going to separate myself from some things in my life, and then I'm going to try to live holy for you. Amen. Man, when you come to that place in your life, none of us are perfect. Don't get me wrong. I'm far from it. But listen, when you come to the place in your life that you're going to do that, that's what you're going to do. Listen, God can take you to the next level in this process that he wants you to do something. But as long as you sit back and say, you know what, I'm just going to sit here and it's me and my four and no more and we're not going to do anything for God. I'm going to hold down the bench and I'm going to sit the bench. God will not be able to use you. Separate yourself unto God and consider yourself holy. Amen. Teenager, when you go to school, you're holy. Do you know that? Right. I, no, you don't have, Tyler, you don't have that little, that little thing around your top of your head. Was it called halo? Have you got one of those, Tyler? Uh, listen, when you go to high school, that doesn't mean you walk around you know, acting like you're better than everybody else, acting like you're a Holy Joe Bible thumper. Listen, but you can win people to Jesus Christ in your high school or your middle school if you live for God and say, I want to be separated and sanctified unto Him and, and, and just follow me and watch me. Did you know Paul said, look at me? Paul said, follow my life. How many of us do that? Hey, boys and girls, follow me and see what I do. Do what I do. That's hard. Because you better watch out what you're doing when you ask everybody else to follow you. But listen, if you sanctify yourself and say, I'm going to separate from some things in my life and I'm going to realize that he's a holy God and I realize I'm going to separate and I'm going to give my life to you, Lord. You're holy and so that is the pattern for my life. 
I'm going to try to live my life holy. I'm going to watch my life. Uh, it'll deliver us from low living. It'll deliver us from over-familiarity with God. Listen, you can be over-familiar with God. You say, Brother Marty, what are you talking about? I'm talking about this. Listen, he is a holy God. He is not the big man upstairs. He's a holy God. Don't disrespect him. We have to get on our both kids all the time because they use the Lord's name in vain. And they don't get it. And I tried to explain it to them like this. When you use the Lord's name in vain, that means you're using his name in a useless way. You're throwing his name out there, and it's not being used for anything. It's useless. That's what vain means. Don't use his name in vain. He's a holy God. It'll deliver us from low living, and it will deliver us from over-familiarity with God. I heard a preacher one time, he said, man, he said, when I get to heaven, I'm going to enter into heaven, and I'm going to run up to Jesus, and I'm going to grab him, and I'm going to hug him, and I'm going to give him a big high five. No, you're not. He's a holy God. You're going to be falling down prostrate before him, and you're going to worship him. He's holy. And listen, Isaiah saw that, and he realized God's holiness. And when we see him as holy, it'll change our attitude about him. Not only that, the real revealing of his holiness. Notice this, the realization of Isaiah's condition. His, his condition. Look at verse 5. Then said I, woe is me. You know what that means? <laughs> that means, oh no. That's what woe means. I tried to find out what the word is kind of difficult to describe. Uh, in, in, in the Hebrew, it means, oh no. I'm in trouble now. Look what he says. Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell, notice this, in a midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. His condition. Hey, Isaiah could have got there and said, yeah, I made it. You know, I'm, I'm, I know, Lord, you just gave me this vision. I'm not dead yet, but it is a vision, Lord. And nobody else gets to see this. And he could have been puffed up. Say, man, look at me. I made it, dude. I'm, I'm the best prophet in, in the whole land. But notice what he says. He said, I am undone because I'm a man of unclean lips. Woe is me. You see, unclean lips reveal an unclean heart. Uh, Psalm 1914 says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Matthew 15, 18 says, But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile the man. Listen, the mouth is connected to the heart. It is. He said, I'm a man of unclean lips. Wait a minute, he's Isaiah the prophet. He's, the guy, he's God's man. Uh, listen, I want you to know, every God's man has, has, has problems in their life. Every God's man has a sin in their life, and they need to deal with it. His life is unconfessed. He needs to deal with his sin. It's hard sometimes to say that we're wrong, especially men. You know, when you've got to apologize to your wife, and you say, I was wrong. Wr wrong. No, I do that all the time. Don't I? That's hard. It's hard for me to admit that I'm wrong. You know why? But see, because I'm always right. I'm never wrong. So when I am wrong, I was wrong in 1985. When I am wrong, sorry, I'm not. When I am wrong, it's hard for me to admit that I'm wrong. Right? I don't know. <laughs> it's hard sometimes. But you know what? The Bible says that when we see ourselves as we are, when he, see, when he saw the holiness of God, it revealed the holiness of God, and it made him realize his condition. That's right. So you say, what's our condition? Let me illustrate it with you. My, I gave my wife some time years ago uh, one of these makeup mirrors, you know. Ladies, it's got the little lights on the side. You know what I'm talking about? And it's got the little slide doohickey where you can change the, you know, if you're outside or if you're inside or if you're under the incandescent lights or something. You know what I'm talking about? It changes the shades of the lights. And it's got the mirror there. And I had a little problem going on with my face one day. I mean, a big problem. Just one day, yeah. Thank you. 
And I said, you know what? I'm not getting what I want out of the bathroom mirror. I'm going to go and I'm going to use that makeup mirror. I'm going to see what this problem is. Yeah. And so I got down there and I tried to select the light. I said, I guess I'll be in the out light outside. So I slide that thing over there and the light's lighting up. And I said, man, it's kind of weird. I wonder what's on the other side of this mirror. <laughs> Flip that mirror over. And you know what's on the other side, ladies, don't you? It's a magnifying mirror. And when you're this close to it and you flip it over, it's like, whoa, dude. What in the world? And you sit and you look at that thing in that magnifying mirror. And you know what? It scared me to death. There was things going on in my skin that I never even saw before. There was stuff popping out in places where it's not supposed to be popping out. And I looked in that mirror and I said to myself, Marty, your face is disgusting. Look at your eyebrows, they're weird. Look at your skin, you got pots and pores and look at the hair is coming out of your nose, it's just horrible. It even scared me. But you know what? When Isaiah saw the holiness of God, when he saw Jesus as he is sitting on the throne, you know what? He saw himself in that magnifying mirror, and he said, oh, I'm undone. I'm unclean. My lips are unclean. I live in a nation of unclean people. And he saw his condition as he really was. And you know what? When we get to that place in our life, when we see our condition, we need to do something about it. Deal with sin in our lives. And young people, when you have sin come to you, when you're tempted with sin, you ought to deal with it real quick because the devil will get a hold of you and he'll drag that thing in your life and he'll say, just take that one little suck off that cigarette. It'll be okay. Listen, I got addicted to cigarettes with one cigarette. And by the time I got saved, I was smoking four packs of cigarettes a day. You know where it started? One cigarette. I mean, I was drinking booze. They'd say, hey, brother, brother. They'd call me brother then. they say, hey, Marty, here's a beer. Try that. Here's some drugs. Try that. And listen, if I, I wasn't saved, and I didn't, have the, I didn't have the ability to say no, but listen, when you're tempted with sin, deal with it quickly and see your condition that you're a sinner and you can fall into that real quick. I was at the bank a couple of days ago, about a week ago. I think I told you the story. And uh, I, I go to Wachovia down here, and I used to walk up ATM. Sometimes I drive in ATM. I, it's always faster just to use the ATM to me. And I went up to the walk up, and there was nobody there. And uh, uh, there was a lady in front of me, I'm sorry. And I was standing about from here to that pew behind her, and she was doing her business, and I didn't want to get clo too close. You know, you think you're going to rob them, you know, something. You got to watch out. And the lady got through, and she walked away. And so I walked up to the ATM, and when I looked at the screen, it didn't look right. There was something wrong, and there was two buttons on the screen. One of the buttons said, another transaction, question mark. And the other button said, return your card, question mark. And I looked at the screen, I said, that, it's not supposed to say that. It's supposed to say, welcome to Wachovia, insert your card. Now, at Wachovia, when you insert your card, it actually physically takes the card out of your hand and sticks it in the machine. Most ATMs, you just slide it in there, but at Wachovia, it takes your card. And so I'm standing there, and I'm saying, what? I don't understand this. And you know what the first thing that popped in my mind when I saw that? Do you want another transaction? You know what's the first thing that popped in my mind? Man, I can hit that button and I can see how much money in cash I can get right now because that lady didn't take her card out of the ATM machine. Yeah. And I thought about it for about... So I pushed return card. By that time, there's five people behind me. So I pushed return card. Card came out. And I turned around. I said, that lady left her card. And I said, y'all see which way she went? And the guy said, he, she went over there. She was in, almost in her car. And so we all started yelling, hey, lady, 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 you left your card. And she came back, and I gave her a card. She didn't say thank you. Did nothing, you know. And I went, I said, can I get back in line? I was, I was like, yes, sir, go ahead, man, Sam. You know what? I thought about it just for a minute. I could have pushed that another transaction. But then I realized I had my shirt on. It said Liberty Baptist Church on <laughs> And I said, you know what, I better not do that. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Listen, 
realize her condition, and deal with it. Aren't you glad that you don't have to confess your sin to a man or to a priest or to anybody else or Brother Matt or Brother Roger or to me? Listen, the only one you have to confess your sin to is that one that's sitting on the throne that's high and lifted up and this train fills the temple. Amen? Aren't you glad of that? Some preachers were sitting around one day and they said, you know what? Our people, they always come to us and they tell us all these stories and they confess their sin to Why don't we just get together and we'll all confess something together? And so the, the four preachers, they thought that was going to be a pretty good idea. I would never do this. And so they started confessing things that they did in their life, just one to the other. And, uh, and they said, confession's good for the soul. And so the one preacher said, you know what? My church don't even know this, but when I get out of church, sometimes I go to the bar. And they said, wow. And another one said, you know what? My church don't know this, but when I get out of church, sometimes I go smoke a big cigar. My church don't know that. And they said, wow. And another guy said, you know what? Uh, when I get out of church, sometimes I go over to my buddies and I play poker. And they said, man, I can't believe that. And they, the fourth guy, he wouldn't say anything. And they said, hey, won't you say something? Why don't you confess? He said, well, he said, I don't know. Uh, I, don't, I don't really have anything to, to say. And they said, come on now, tell us your secret. What's your, what's your advice in your life? And the fourth preacher said, well, it's gossiping. And I can hardly wait to get out of here. <laughs> Listen. You don't have to confess to a man. You don't have to confess to a priest. You don't have to confess to a preacher. You don't have to confess to me. It won't do you any good. Realize your condition and confess it to, before him. Amen. Oh, listen, Isaiah realized his condition real quick. If God wants to take you to the next level, next level in your life and he wants to use you in an unusual way, we have to deal with sin in our life. First John 1 John 1.9 says if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Notice the number three, three thing is the refining of Isaiah. He, he confessed it. He said, oh, I'm unclean. Look at verse 6. Then flew one of the seraphims, unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken from the tongs off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched my lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. Now remember, this is a vision now. And so the Bible says after he did that, that the seraphim went to the altar. Boy, that's a great place to go. He went to the altar and he took a hot coal off the altar. Listen, this coal had been close to the blood of the sacrifice. And this, this coal had been close to the fire of God. And the seraphim brought it and he put it on his lips. And the Bible says in, in verse number 7, He laid it on my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips. Thy, thy iniquity is taken away and thy sin is purged. Aren't you glad for the forgiveness of sin in your life? Listen, if, if you're in sin and you confess it, it's a load off, your, load off your life, isn't it? It's a load off your mind. It's a load off your heart. The refining of Isaiah. Listen, God can fix anything. You say, well, my sin's too big. No, it's not. God can fix anything. You say, well, you don't know what I've done. I don't, don't want to know what you've done. He can fix anything. He made it. He can fix it. One day, Henry Ford was driving down a country road one day, and he saw one of his Model T cars on the side of the road, and a man had the hood up, and he was inside the thing. And so Henry Ford stopped and asked the man, and said, can I help you? He said, man, I can't, I can't get this thing going. It's dead on the side of the road, and I can't fix it. I can't get it going. And Henry Ford, he, he got down in there, and just a few minutes had that Model T cranked up and ready to go. And the man said, how did you do that? He said, I don't understand how you did that. How could you fix it so easy? And Ford told him, said, listen, I designed it. I can fix it. Listen, he designed us. He can fix us. He can forgive us of our sin. He can purge us of our sin. And he can put us on a rock. He, and he can use us. Remember, this is a vision now. So the seraphim takes the coal and puts it on his mouth. And he, and he purges his sin. Oh, listen, to have forgiveness of sin is a wonderful thing. And that's what Isaiah did. Notice the next thing. We've seen the revealing of God's holiness and the realization of Isaiah's condition and the refining of Isaiah. Number four, notice the response to his call. The response. Verse eight. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? I like that verse. Who is us? 
Let us make man in our image. And he says, who's going to go for us? Who is us? It's the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We're looking, us three are looking for somebody to go for us. <clears throat> Whom shall I send? Who for shall go for us? Then I said, here I am, send me. The response to his call. So Isaiah, what are you going to do? Man, the land's, the land's in shambles. The king's dead. Uh, the land's full, the, full of iniquity. And things are going on. He hears the voice of God. Who's going to go for us? And he responds to the Lord. Instantly, with no delay, Isaiah said, Here I am. I'll go. You know what? He didn't stand there, guys. He said, Hmm, let's see. Lord wants somebody to go for us. Who's going to go? I wonder if he'll go. Nah. Who's going to go? For? I'm gonna, oh, I'm gonna, nah, he won't go. I wonder, nah. He didn't do that. He didn't look around and say, I wonder if he's going to step up. I wonder if he's going to go. Isaiah said, hey, here I am. He raised his hand and said, here I am. I'll go for you, Lord. No hesitation. He didn't, he, didn't, he didn't get that sentence out. Who will go? And immediately said, I'm going to go for you, Lord. I'm going to serve you, God. It's a wicked nation, and you need somebody to go down there with these purged lips and preach God's word. See, Isaiah, you got the full, you got the full Godhead on your side. You got us on your side. Listen, we got us on our side, too. He's ready for us to do something for him. God is ready to assume full responsibility for the life that is wholly yielded to him. And you say, I'll go, Lord. I'll do whatever you want me to do. Listen, you don't have to be afraid of doing that. You don't have to be afraid of saying, you know what, I'm afraid to go. I don't know what he's going to do in my life. I thought Lord's going to call me to go some crazy country or something. I said, Lord, I want to go. I want to do what you want me to do. And God will take you through the process, much like Isaiah went through the process in his life. He'll take you through that process. He promises to take responsibility. If he called you, he'll make it happen. And he'll take care of you, and he'll lead you, and he'll guide you, and he'll lead you right to where you want to be. His response. He said, I'll go. Here I am. Send me. Isaiah didn't say, now, Lord, where do you want me to go? He didn't say that. Uh, he didn't say, okay, Lord, I'll go, but what's in it for me? How much am I going to get? He didn't say, okay, Lord, I'll go, but how much am I going to get paid? What's my salary? Uh, he didn't say, okay, Lord, I'll go, but I've got to know what the retirement benefits are going to be. No. He said, Lord, here I am. Send me. I don't know exactly what you want me to do, Lord. I don't know exactly where you want me to go except for you want me to preach to the people and you want me to tell them about you. And there was no hesitation in his life. Listen, don't be afraid of responding to God's call in your life, no matter what it is. Don't be afraid of that. Because he promises to take care of you. Now notice this. It says in, in verse number 8, And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who shall go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go. That's, right. That's all you need. <laughs> all you need is the Lord to say, Go. I didn't say go. He didn't say go. Brother Rogers didn't say go. The Lord said go. Get them. Do what, you, do what you, I'm calling you to do. Do what you, I, I've set up you apart to do. I wonder tonight if we're just holding back a little bit. I wonder tonight, young person, is God speaking to you to do something for him? And you're just, you're, you're trying to figure this thing out. And you're thinking in your life, and then if I do that, he's going to send me to Africa. He might. He might, he, you know what? He might send you right here. That's what he did, did in my life. Uh, yeah, but Brother Marty, if he calls me, he, 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 might, he, might, he might make a preacher out of me. 
That wouldn't be the worst thing in the world that God could do. But I want to be a football player. Well, if that's what you want to be and that's what God wants you to be, that's fine. But if God's calling you to do something for him, wouldn't it be better for you to do something for God than to do something for some football team? Then in a few years, it's going to be pff, nothing. But whatever you do for God lasts forever and ever and ever and ever. Man, I, I, I'm clipping coupons, Brother Steve. Every kid gets saved, I think about that. In heaven, forever and ever and ever, there's a soul that gets to live forever in heaven instead of forever in hell. Isn't that more important than the baseball team? Isn't that, isn't that more important than your job that you're holding on to? That you think, man, I can't give up my job. I'll, I'll go broke. I'll lose my house. No, no, you won't. He promises to take care of you if that's what he wants to do in your life. And I wonder, man, listen, if you're holding back, why don't you just say, okay, I see you're a your, your holy God, and I see my condition. I, yeah, I, I'm wrong. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a man of unclean lips. And I live in a nation of unclean people. Oh, don't we live there? Huh? Wouldn't it be good if we saw that in our life? And then God says, I'm looking for somebody to do something for me. Who's that going to be? And we jump up and say, that's me. That's what, that's what, that's what I want to do. Wouldn't it be better for Liberty Baptist Church in Stockbridge, Georgia, if it got into a place in its life where almost everybody realize that? What could be done in this place? You say, you say, you, you can't do anything right here in Stockbridge, Georgia. It's been, been here 30-something years. Hey, listen, <laughs> there's 30 more years to go, folks. There's 30,000 people right outside of our door that still need Jesus. And we got to keep on keeping on. Maybe tonight you'd like to come and just say, you know what, I'm just going to give my life to the Lord. I don't understand it all. I'm just going to say, okay, Lord, I'm going to give my life to you. Lord, you take my life and do what you want to with my life. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing tonight? Let's all stand. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Maybe you need to come to the altar tonight and say, Lord, that's what I want in my life. I confess my sin. Maybe you need to come tonight and just say, Lord, I've, I've got things in my life that I need to get right with you. Maybe you need to come and confess that sin. Uh, listen, you don't have to confess it to me. You don't have to come down front and tell everybody. You just come and tell the Lord about it. There's things in my life i got to deal with before I can be used of God. And maybe you need to come and do that. We're not going to embarrass you. I promise you that. Maybe you just need to come and say, Lord, I I'm at that place in my life where I want to do something for you, Lord, and I want to be that one to go. Would you do that tonight? Why don't you come as they sing? Let's pray. Father, bless our people now as they come. In Jesus' name.